Welcome, voice friends, to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. My name is Liz Johnson, and today I'm very pleased and um, excited to share information and an interview uh, with John Nix, who is an associate professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio. He's also the founder of their vocal arts lab there, correct? You're seeing part of it behind me. Excellent. <laughs> um, and he is also uh, studied with the late, great Barbara Dosher, who has um, given this world a lot of great information, and I can't wait to talk with you about that, John. Cool. Um, you are also active in research, which is a wonderful combination. You're, you're a master teacher, and then you're also in, involved in research, so I'm excited to bring that to the table and to show people that that is possible and that people are doing it, and I look forward to talking with you about your research in that regard. Um, and I think I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. So first, sure. thank you for being here today. Well, it's a real pleasure. Um, in full disclosure, um, I got to take some classes with you at the Summer Vocology Institute back in 2012. So that's where I first met you. Yeah. And learned a ton from you there. So thank you for that. And it was it was a pleasure to get to work with you. Has and it been that long? It's been that long. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a few less hairs ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So I've gotten to see um, John's work up close and personal. And by the way, if anybody's interested, John does have some interviews out there. Not interviews, but um, teaching videos on YouTube. So you can actually see him work and get to hear a lot of what he does there. Um, so go check that out. Um, but I'm just going to jump in and ask, you know, how did you get interested in voice science? Not everybody is, is interested in it. How how'd that happen for you? Well, I kind of have had a twisting path because I started my undergrad degree thinking I was going to go into uh, like sports science or exercise physiology, uh, sports medicine. And so I thought, okay, I'll get a, like a biology degree and then I'll go to med school or I don't know. I'm not quite sure what that's that's what my thinking was. So uh, that all ended when I got to organic chemistry, when I realized that the book that was that thick, that was just fall quarter. Um, so, um, you know, but uh, in my undergrad, I had, you know, uh, a year of calculus and honors physics and inorganic chemistry and so on. So, um, and high school AP biology. So I've always had an interest in the sciences. Um, but anyway, so I, I then was a psychology major with a music minor. What? And then uh, I ended up being, uh, getting a music, you know, degree. And I have a bachelor's in Italian literature and, uh, and a, a bachelor's in, in music with a minor in Italian literature and a minor in psychology. So, yeehaw, uh, perpetual student. <laughs> right. Um, then there's a couple of years where I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to make a living as a musician. And so I got a master's at Florida State in uh, arts administration, which has come in handy with grant writing and helped me get some other jobs. And that's where I met my wife. Uh, so all, all things considered, I turned out okay with that degree. And it was during that time that I had been uh, hired to sing Nanki Poo in the Mikado in a, a production in Colorado at the University of Colorado. And um, I was having struggles with my high range. And so they arranged for me to have some lessons with Barbara Dosher. And I had heard of her and everybody had said, oh gosh, you know, you, you gotta, gotta work with her. I'm like, okay, fine. So I had a couple of lessons and it was like, oh, 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 okay. That's 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 turning my world upside down. And quickly realized, um, okay, I need to finish this degree and move to Colorado. And um, my wife had, uh, well, fiance, I guess at the time, had um, had a lesson with Barbara as well. And we both thought, okay, yeah, we probably need to find a way to get out here because we really enjoyed working with her. Um, and it was the first time in my life that I had really felt like I was with a teacher who um, really understood um, everything 
about how uh, the voice functioned and everything she said made sense with all of my background in science. You know, it's a very evidence-based approach. So we left that summer, um, you know, with a copy of Barbara's book and reading it and starting to really um, immerse ourselves, especially me, in um, voice production and and those kind of things. So ended up, uh, fast forward, we ended up going to Colorado and we studied with Barbara. And then after she passed away, um, I ended up teaching, well, we both ended up teaching at the University of Colorado at Denver, which was right across the street from where the National Center for Voice and Speech was at the time. And uh, Ingo was over there, and uh, the lady who was kind of the head of the theater department at UCD was friends with Ingo, and she said, we're going to do uh, some workshops with the National Center. You want to, you know, join up? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So um, got to know Ingo a little bit, and we had actually corresponded and talked on the phone a time or two. Um, and, you know, one thing led to the other, and then I started working for Ringo. Um, I took the vocology courses, and then I started working for Ringo. So, you know, it took me a while, but I guess um, in my own way, I did kind of end up in sports science and sports medicine, in a sense. It's just, it's, it's vocal athletics. Um, and... You know, so in my work here, I teach pedagogy, I teach uh, voice, and then I'm kind of the go-between uh, our music department and uh, Dr. Blake Simpson and Dr. Laura Dominguez and uh, Rachel Spear, who's a really fine speech pathologist, at the medical center here. And so they will refer... Um, singers who come through their clinic to me because I'm, I'm not your average singing teacher, but I have this other uh, knowledge base um, and have worked with speech pathologists and, you know, laryngologists and stuff in my past. So anyway, um, it's been kind of a long and twisted road, but I, I managed to get here eventually. So that's kind of the long story. Okay. What was it like working with Barbara Dosher? What was it like? Um, well, she um, she and I just kind of clicked on a particular level. Um, I tend to be very high energy and I speak very fast. Um, she was very deliberate and uh, at least she was with me um, because I think she saw she needed to slow me down and get me to for me, who uh, tends to be, you know, more of an intellectual processor, having me uh, attend to what I'm feeling and the emotion of the music was essential, really, for me um, getting things together. I mean, obviously, I, you know, tapped into her great technical um, experience um, but I think for me personally, she was always saying, you know, you think way too much as it is. You know, I, I want you to be um, focused on uh, the expression and, and what you're feeling in your body um, and maybe not so much what's going on between your ears, which, you know, for other students, it was the other way around, you know, who were very visceral and emotionally driven uh, performers she was saying, okay, hang on, let's think about what you're doing here for a second. You know, so I think one thing that it was really great uh, about working with her was her ability to adapt to whatever the student needed. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just that tremendous um, knowledge base because she had worked with Burton Coffin, but she was also very much influenced by uh, a, Louis Cunningham, who was teaching at the University of Colorado at the same time. And Cunningham was not Mr. Pedagogy, not science-based at all, but he really knew people and he really knew um, the, to find the right way to say something. Mm -hmm. um, 
at least that's what I'm told, you know, by folks who knew him, Patty Peterson, um, who knew him, and of course through Barbara. Um, and so I think she learned that there had to be some kind of a balance between um, the scientific approach and the human approach to, and melded that very well in her own teaching. Um, I did a presentation on her teaching for the Nats um, summer workshop 2017, I guess it was. And um, I've since then I've written that up. And in fact, I'm waiting to hear back from Dick Schertzma almost any day now, whether they've accepted it for publication in the Journal of Singing. Um, and in that article, I, I, you know, I talk about aspects of her teaching, um, things that she emphasized, uh, things that she didn't, some things about her personality, um, some nice pithy quotes of hers. Um, and then I've annotated everything she ever published. So um, every one of her articles, you know, a paragraph synopsis of it and a full bibliographic entry. So, so as a result, and I've put some videos, uh, a video of her teaching a pedagogy class um, and two lectures of hers about vowel modification. And I hope um, maybe in the next six months or so, if I can um, twist one of my graduate students' arms, um, I've got uh, lesson tapes that I have of her teaching me and teaching my wife and um, maybe making um, some of the better ones of those available. Um, <laughs> and I know, uh, you know, other friends of mine who were in her studio, um, Jeremy A, who teaches at NYU Steinhardt, and Brian Gill, who's at Indiana, um, Robin Julian Best, who are at Baylor, a number of us, we've kept those tapes, um, probably Mark Calkins and Cynthia Lawrence in Kentucky. Uh, we've kept those lesson recordings. We may not listen back to them because our voices, of course, have changed in 20 years, but uh, listen back to them from that, oh, I gotta do it that way, but just to hear the approach, um, Dasha was a very patient teacher in some respects in that she would listen with a student um, very carefully. Um, she took a very deliberate pace in vocalizing people. Um, oftentimes she wouldn't be saying a lot, she would be processing a lot. And she'd say, do you want to do that one again? Instead of, you know, blah, 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 you know, rapid fire. She'd just say, do you want to do that one again? And you go, yeah. And you do it again. And she would go, do you understand what just happened? And uh, she was withholding saying things oftentimes, which we now know from, you know, a lot of the research in motor learning. Um, you know, she was kind of delaying giving some of the feedback to see have we internally done that stuff. So the way she taught really fostered uh, independence and and was really looking at learning and not a performance shift in the moment. She was okay. She was very tolerant of this being kind of a wild, um, not so good sound right now in order to get to where the person needed to go in three months, six months, a year. Um, and I think that took a lot of getting used to for people who, who weren't ready for that. Um, but it, for those people who struggled with that, I found she was very emotionally supportive. And, you know, she'd say, you have to understand that this is going to get probably worse before it gets better because you have, um, and she would be pretty straightforward. She'd say, you know, you have some habits here that we're having to, to undo. And eventually we're going to, I mean, we're working in the direction of instilling some new habits. Um, but you're going to have to kind of be tolerant here for a while. And she would talk to us as teachers that you also have to be tolerant through that time and be very um, supportive with your students to get them through those, those periods of, of struggle into, you know, a freer way. 
because you have to, you know, you get to the point where you, you realize the old way is wrong mm -hmm. and yet the new way hasn't gotten completely established yet. And so it's completely unstable. You know, um, for me, it was um, singing way too um, pressured in my passaggio and all the compensatory tensions extrinsically that came with that, with my tongue especially uh, and my jaw. And getting that released and yet at the same time slowly working on getting the right kind of function of my extrinsic muscles to say position my larynx. Um, you know, there was a period of bleh, <laughs> where it didn't work very well. Um, and so she was very, very good at, I think, looking at the long term. And um, that kind of patience is really, she had the luxury, I think, you know, not being in, say, a New York City or a Los Angeles or something where, um, you know, there's the pressure of go, 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 go. And um, this person's coming in here and they want the quick fix. She was not a quick fixer. She was, okay, um, you're here for this degree and we're going to work through this process. And she was, as a result, very, very um, conservative and cagey about the repertoire she chose for students, um, when to encourage them to do public performing and not. Um, you know, I think she had really kind of absorbed the big picture of how do I help this person um, free up their voice and not be psychologically defeating in the process, you know, to, to find the right venues and times for that person to put the new way of doing things out in public. Wow, how long did you get to work with her? Um, let's see, I worked with her the summer of 1990 and the summer of 1991, because I was working for Central City Opera. Um, and then from about April of 92 until she died in June of 96. So four years plus some, some other work. Um, but I think I learned almost as much from the lessons that I had with her. Um, I learned by observing her teach because she had open studio and uh, that's one of the great strengths uh, of the program there at Colorado and they've continued this and and of course I've done that here is that studios are open and encouraging pedagogy students um, well requiring because you had to do lesson observations but but building that idea of going and learning from each other and that there aren't secrets in a studio um, and being able to watch her and watch uh, Bob Harrison and Pat Mason and Julie Simpson, who were all on the faculty there, and Patty Peterson, um, who was Barbara's student. Um, you know, it, it gave me so much um, knowledge, how to uh, proceed with issues, how to pace working with a student. Um, what do you say to reinforce um, in the right way? Um, when to leave good, uh, well enough alone, um, you know, and, and it's hard because you feel like the student's going to feel like I'm not teaching them anything, but you are teaching them loads. Um, I describe in that article uh, how she, you know, you would come in and she typically had, you know, a couple of exercises that she would use every week with you and she would think really long and hard okay what are the things that are going to get at this person's issues without causing some other problem in the process and she would just very patiently work on those um and you know measuring the progress from week to week well you would come in and she'd say okay let's do and um you know it might be I don't know, I had a really tight jaw, you know, and so it might be blah, 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 just to scale down on blah, 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 blah. And she would sit there and she'd play the scale and then she'd just play the next chord and it might be five minutes of just moving around with that one exercise. 
And every once in a while she'd go, hmm. Or she'd say, oh, that was a really good one. Or do you want to do that one again? And then sometimes, you know, it might be three or four minutes and she'd just nod. And you'd get done and she would say, do you have any questions about what we've just been doing? Because it's sounding really good. And, you know, generally, you, you know, you learn to just kind of, that was a time for settling down. She was observing your body alignment. She was observing your breathing. She was observing, okay, how are they releasing the air today? You know, how are these technical issues that we've been slowly chipping away at, how are they today? Um, before ever really saying a whole lot. And I thought that was so wise um, just to let the person sing for a while without a lot of yap, 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 yap at them. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, my wife came from a situation um, at Florida State where she had been with a teacher who was, you know, pretty aggressive and, and very, you know, in her face. And she had a lesson with Barbara and she thought, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that we got much done. And then she listened back to the lesson recording. She went, oh, oh, oh yeah, we did get a lot done. So anyway, um, I could talk about her all day, as you can tell. Yeah, I mean, she was ahead of her time, wasn't she? Yeah, in a lot of ways. I mean, she was, for starters, um, in a in a field, you know, that it had been dominated by, um, you know, Ralph Appleman and and William Bernard and Coffin and, um, you know, other males. Here was this non-traditional student because she was in her 40s when she went back to school to get her advanced degrees. Really? Yeah, she was in her 40s. Um, I think she got her doctorate at 51. I'd have to look up again. Yay! Yeah, yeah, it was really, or 50, it might even have been 56. I have to think, let's see, she was born in 1922. I know it was 19, it was 50, she was 56 when she got like a tenure track job. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look, I'm, I'm babbling on the, on the years right now. I'd have to look it up because I have all of that um, in the article, kind of a chronology of how she spent her time. But yeah, she was a, she was a late learner. She came back to school, um, you know, in her forties. Mm -hmm. Um she and her husband, John, were both non-traditional students. That's how they met. They met at a, uh, this is a very funny story. They met at a, uh, you know, kind of like a, an event for non-traditional students at the University of Colorado. And it was kind of boring. And, and he said, you want to go blow this party and go somewhere else? And she was like, yeah, okay. He took her to a strip bar. <laughs> Well, as she put it, he took me to a bar with exotic dancers. <laughs> so anyway, they were quite a couple. He was a uh, elementary school teacher. He taught uh, math. Wow. And I think she learned as much from him as she did from Coffin. Um, she sort of learned a lot about him, about um, people and and being human and, and, you know, because whether, whether you're in elementary school or you're in graduate school, um, we still have those same vulnerabilities. Um, and sh I found that, uh, I mean, she could be tough as hell on people um, when it called for it, but she could also be very tender and warm with people. I never got, I only got the tough side from her one time because I hadn't learned a piece that she really wanted me to do. And I kind of put it off. No, um, um, we haven't rehearsed that yet. Let's. And so finally I was in a lesson and she was like, no, let's take a look at that today. And she made me basically sight read the piece, you know, and it was like, okay, now next week, staring at me over those glasses, 
you know, she said, I want this learned. I want to hear it again. I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and she came down on me sternly one time in a pedagogy class because I'd given a student a piece that was too difficult. And she, she read me the riot act in front of the class. And I never made that mistake again. Good teacher. So. How about your own research? How about my own research? Oh, um, own research. You've done so much. Um, well, thanks. Um, I of you as an expert in semi-occluded vocal tract knowledge. Yeah. Um, what research have you done around that topic? Um, well, a couple of things. I've got a project going on right now, actually, with one of my grad students that's really interesting. But um, I've written about, um, you know, the lip trills and the raspberries. That was one of my first articles. Um, was about using them as alternatives to using um, the nasals. And that article was written um, in response. There was a, a high school choral director uh, in Boulder area who basically everything they did was ming, 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 ming. And my, my point was, well, the person's palate never has a chance to go up. Um, and had a lot of, um, you know, sources backing up what I was saying and that the lip trills and the raspberries had some advantages in terms of freeing things up um, articulation wise. Um, then, I mean, I've been interested in them for years. I did lip trills as an undergraduate um, and my undergraduate teacher was like, okay, he wasn't, <laughs> He wasn't a big uh, he wasn't a big advocate of them, but he was like, okay, well, that's fine. Um, um, then, of course, working for Ingo, and Ingo was doing a lot of the theoretical work on uh, the straw phonation uh, at that time, and we bounced a lot of ideas back and forth uh, during that time. Um, and then, since you know, I had a tenure track job and needing to publish, um, uh, have done some things, especially um, the, the first thing that I think we did that was really kind of interesting, Blake Simpson and I did uh, a video where I was doing um, all the different semi-occluded postures, um, and we were just, we were looking at, um, you know, kind of what was going on in the uh, epilaryngeal area and so on. And, um, and in that article, um, I later found out, I guess I was maybe the first person to have ever done this to kind of classify all the semi-occluded postures into different categories where, you know, you have the straw uh, and humming um, and uh, the coffin standing wave exercise where you where you have your hand over your open mouth and you do different vowels, where you have a constant occlusion, and then the um, oscillatory ones like the lip buzz, buzz, the raspberry, singing with the straw into water, um, where the occlusion is, you know, you've got varying pressures. Um, and um, then you have those where um, it's a transitory occlusion. So uh, the, the voice plosives and the semivowels, the glides. Um, and I didn't realize that was anything earth shattering until I heard Jackie Garner Schmidt cite me, you know, and was like, really? Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, oh, cool. Um, how about that? You know, um, uh, project that I have going on right now. Um, and I want to say, I mean, my gosh, um, Ingo and Anna Maria Laukinen and um, Marco Guzman, um, they've been really doing so much work with, um, and, and Lynn Maxfield. Um, anyway, you know, they've done a lot of laboratory work, which has been really wonderful. The project that we have going right now is, uh, because it kind of comes from the Colorado tradition, is the the open mouth hum is what Coffin called it. Dosher called it uh, Coffin's standing wave exercise. And Ingo um, said, you know, we have standing waves in the vocal tract all the time. 
um, maybe there's a better name for that. And he saw me do it a couple of times. He says, what about manually occluded vocal tract? And so anyway, that's what we're calling it for this study. Um, and what we're looking at is changes in, um, well, uh, when people do it, um, Coffin's thinking on it was that by doing it, and, and I think he may have fluoroscoped some people, um, he, he found that it um, freed up uh, constrictive stuff in the uh, superior and, and the middle constrictor muscles, the swallowing. Um, I'm not, maybe it does that. I think more than anything, probably the, um, the fossil pillars, um, there's some, and maybe some freeing up in, um, you know, the, the muscles that make up the fossil pillars, the, the glossopalatine and the pharyngopalatine. Um, at any rate, so I'll just demonstrate. I've made a YouTube video of this, but um, so say I'm singing an ah, ah, and I take my hand, um, um, ah. So I'm singing the vowel with my hand over my mouth and then I release. Um, Dasher used this some in her teaching of both men and women. With men, she would use it kind of pre passaggio area and maybe up into the passaggio. With women, she tended to use it to um, tune up the upper part of the middle voice. Mm -hmm. So that tricky area there around like um, A4 to about D5. Um, and she would use it in that zone, doing different vowels for different purposes. So in the study we're doing, um, first of all, we're having the people, you know, sing the ah, and then we're having, and they, um, they sing and then they drop into fry so we can get a sense of their formant frequencies. Then having them do, mm, and they drop into fry while they're occluded and getting the formant frequencies of basically that occluded posture and then have them do mm -hmm. to see if there's been after you know doing the occlusion and releasing is there any change in the formant frequencies as a result of you know doing the posture and all the while when we have the sustained vowels getting uh, vibrata data, data and things like that. Um, so that project, we've collected all the data and now we're kind of crunching it all at this point. Um, Inga was kind of interested. Um, I have some theories about the best ways to do it and, and it actually may vary from some of what Dasher used to do, um, but we'll see. I mean, um, we're going to check it, the data. Um, and uh, in January, uh, Brian Gill and Patty Peterson and I, along with several others of Barbara's students, are getting together here at UTSA, and we're going to knock ideas around for a while, so that'll be really fun. That's excellent. So I hear you speaking to the future of voice science and, and vocal pedagogy in that we're entering a time where we're actually able to test some of these things and find out what is most effective. Yeah. So thinking along those lines, where do you see voice science and vocal pedagogy merging? I think as we get more and more people who've come through the evidence-based approach, that um, that is what is, is um, driving how they work with their students. Um, well, and, and to not say that some of the old stuff is bad and, and is, no. needs to be discarded, it's actually, well, now we know why that works and when to use it in a more effective fashion right. or how to structure the practice um, in a more effective uh, fashion. Um, I see, um, and I am so thankful for someone like Ian Howell at NEC, you know, who said, well, we're, we've done a lot of great stuff with um, acoustics of production, but what about the psychoacoustics of perception? And I think he's leading the field in some interesting ways there to really, you know, 
people have gotten a lot more informed about this and now they need to be more informed about this because yeah. this is what we use to train this yep. in a lot of ways. So I'm very excited about that. And um, I think finding um, people are finding in their own studios, I think the, what is most effective for them in terms of the use or non-use of technology in their teaching. I mean, Jim Dewing uses Voce Vista a lot more than I ever do. Um, with particular students, I will, I will have it up and running, and maybe there's something of value there. Maybe not. It's, it's running, and it's next to the mirror, and if the student finds it valuable, then we talk about what we're seeing. And if not, it's just there, and it's, it's another bit of information that's available in the room, just like you don't always look at the mirror. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, my favorite saying about that, and I say this to my pedagogy students, is invention is not the mother of necessity. That's kind of <laughs> taking that expression and flipping it around because we have a lot of these great tools, but there are times when it is not constructive to use them. You know, if a person has a recital coming up, they need to be worried about their expression and that their diction has great subtlety and that their movements have meaning and underline what they're saying. Um, that's not the time for me to have an EGG on them, you know? Um, so I think it's, uh, that comes with experience, that learning what does this person need right now? What's the best way for me to uh, serve this student with the knowledge base that I have in making the choices to to make suggestions or to not say anything at all um, yeah. and, and see if they can figure it out. Now, one of my things I think I really learned from Dosher was, you know, rather than have, I've seen teachers who do this and, you know, and I will occasionally approach things this way, but, you know, they will be very much Okay, now watch your tongue move, watch your tongue move, see what's going on there. Um, for, the, for the student who is very kinesthetically unaware, perhaps that would be valuable to do some work like that. But what I would rather do, instead of make the person have a complex about their tongue, is instead, um, okay, let's do um, this pattern, and we're gonna go, um, potica, 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 pa, and by, setting the pattern up in the right way, I'm actually having their tongue do a particular set of movements that is going to be beneficial for, you know, the issue they're dealing with without me saying, okay, now we're working on your tongue. We're working on freeing up your tongue. That's like, I don't even bother to say that because <laughs> then that tongue, as Dosher famously said, is going to feel like it's like the size of, you know, a table instead <laughs> You know, it's just like, okay, well, let's just do um, the, 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 and I'm giving them a consonant that fronts their tongue um, without me having to say, now keep your tongue forward. Okay, your tongue's falling back on that O. Oh, you know, that's just not productive in my view. Ken Bozeman talks a lot about that too, right? He, you know, yeah. if you give an instruction to the tongue, you're not going to get what you want anyway. No. So you can't do it. Yeah, yeah. So instead, you know, find a way. And, and I know people um, probably would differ with me on this. Um, yeah, there are times when you need to say, tell someone pretty directly. But for me, that's pretty rare. I'm, I'm generally a little more backdoor with things. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather sneak up on a problem. And then as the student is, is processing it, they'll go, oh, well, that's really helping my tongue. And I'll go, yeah, it is. Okay, now let's do this. You know, okay, they've put two and two together without okay. me saying anything yeah. about it. So, so just a, one last question. Are yeah. there any um, scientific, voice science related discoveries that have just sh shaped you or changed you or um, even in your own research, something you discovered that surprised you or changed the way you practiced? Um, I think the, the motor learning um, 
information which I first, you know, encountered with Ingo and with Kitty Bertolini, um, gosh, nearly 20 years ago. I think um, that really revolutionized how I practice myself. Mm -hmm. And I started incorporating, um, uh, you know, distributed practice and variable practice um, in my own practice. And then, um, you know, starting to incorporate that with my students. So for instance, um, here at UTSA, all of our voice faculty do this. Um, I'm very, very much uh, in favor of this here is, you know, instead of the one hour lesson one day a week, well, they come in for 30 minutes twice a week. So we see them, you know, we have um, contact with them two different times plus a seminar class. Um, and so it's distributing that time that we're interacting with the student. Um, I encourage my students to, you know, do smaller practice sessions um, more frequently through the day. Um, so I would think, I think the motor learning stuff and then just continuing to learn the benefits of the semi-occluded um, postures. I've been using the straw more, I think in the last year or two, um, in some different ways that I hadn't used it before. Um, and finding, um, well, here's my thinking on, on uh, the straw and uh, the, the coffin standing wave thing, the manually occluded vocal tract posture. And that is, okay, if you're occluding like that, then the first form is going to drop really, really low. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be thinking about particular vowels um, that for first format reasons are gonna work well, but actually something that's gonna give you a wide frequency range second format wise. Well, so we know when we occlude, all the format things are gonna drop, but um, you know, the first format's gonna drop really, really low. The second format is gonna drop some, but not nearly so much. Well, which vowels have the highest second formants? Well, E and A. And so if you want someone vocalizing over a wide frequency range um, into a straw or with their hand, you know, over their mouth, um, then a front vowel is probably the best choice. Um, and so, you know, I will have students, um, like soprano students, um, you know, and they'll look at me crazy. I'll say, okay, uh, do an A vowel into your hand and we're going to try that again. And they'll go, really? I'll like, just give it a try. And they go, oh, wow, you know, that feels better than the ah did, you know? So, uh, and I, it's a matter of they're on the upslope of the second format rather than on the, the, the backside of it if they were doing like an O or an O. Um, so some things like that, you know, the, the work with semi-occluded, um, just continuing to incorporate what has been learned there uh, into practical use in the studio and, and then continuing to just absorb motor learning and, and ways to best structure practice. I think um, those are the things that have really been kind of blowing my mind. Although I do have to say reading Ian's uh, dissertation um, right. over the summer was just like, oh God, my mind is blown. <laughs> Follow the ferrets, yes. Um, anyway, so that's, that's what's kind of been blowing my mind lately. I want to learn more about some of the work that people have been doing, Richard Lismore and some others, on uh, the ultrasound. I want to learn a little bit more about that because, you know, pretty non-invasive way to see, well, what is your tongue really doing? Um, you know, some of those structures that we can't necessarily see at least we can see the front part, but we can't see what's going on behind. I'd be interested in learning more about that. Yeah, that, that sounds like a very good next interview in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. And as I come up with more and better questions, would you be interested in talking again? Absolutely, absolutely. Great, and just to, to cap it off, um, if you were gonna give some, some advice to a young voice researcher 
I know this is a very broad question, but what are some things that you would tell them to look for? Um, I would tell them what Johann Sundberg tells people, and that is find something that you're absolutely fascinated about and that you want to do the work yeah. because if it's not something you're really interested in, you're not going to want to do the work. Yeah. Um, and there is a lot of work to it. Um, it is not fun to sit and go through 78 uh, different subjects, uh, vibrato uh, samples, doing three different conditions on five different vowels. I can tell you from personal yeah. experience, I mean, do the math, 78 times three times five. That was a lot of samples. Yeah. That was not fun. No. Uh, but I was fascinated to see what we got out of it. And that's what kept me to it. And I would also say, um, if somebody is, you know, of a research mindset, I hope that they also um, are a vocalist of some kind, whether they're an actor or a singer or a public speaker, um, that they understand the uh, personally um, that experience of good vocalization and not just the intellectual exercise. Yeah, those are great pieces of advice and a great place to end the interview. So thank you, John, so much for your time. I know thank you helpful to a lot of people. In your well, life. hope so. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks, Liz. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye.